to fix all of these places with traditional processes. Exception of safety from the park. Um, they wanted to. In a soap. And the reason is, is because. Give us the feedback. Uh, give us the feedback. It's how we can challenge the plan. Government needs to play on it as well. Today we've got a really a, a different program that, than we normally have because today we're going to have be double teamed. We've got two speakers. That's great. And today this is uh, something that here at Spokane we're really proud of because there's only 22 of these hospitals in the whole nation and we happen to have one of them right here. And the story that I say on my tours is how it got started with a connection with uh, Levi Hutton, so which is also from right here. So we here at Spokane have a, a very intricate tie to our subject tonight. So our, I'll introduce our speakers as each one's going to speak. And our first speaker here today, her name is Kristen Milo Smith. She's the marketing and communications director for the Shriners Hospital. She's been there for eight years, and she's going to just talk about the Shriners Hospital. And then the next speaker will be talking about the history of the Shriners. So here is Christine Marla Smith, and talking about the Shriners Hospital. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here, and I was telling some of the people at my table, I, I've been there, you know, just over eight years, and. I know our general history, but kind of doing this was, I learned a lot more that I actually didn't know and some of the little details. And um, so as um, you just heard, we have a very close, um, we're very proud of Spokane because Spokane really was the impetus of the entire system. Back in 1920, when the national convention, so every July they have the imperial session where all the Shriners gather and the, impo the, the imperial potentate came through Spokane on his way to Portland, met Levi Hutton and had a conversation with him about what he was doing and was so impressed about how he was caring for children thought, okay, we've got all these men, what can we do to take care of children? So that really was the beginning of the entire system. So that was in 1920. In 1922, the first hospital was opened in Shreveport, Louisiana. And only two years later, we were open, but we're actually the seventh hospital in the system. So um, we were opened in 1924 in November. We're actually pretty close to our date. Um, and we were, like I said, with seventh. And the first hospital, we weren't a freestanding hospital. We were just a, a ward on St. Luke's where we had 20 beds. And it stayed that way for quite some time until the Shriners locally, um, well, our whole region, we cover, um, we started covering and we still cover the same region. It's Washington. Idaho, North Idaho, um, BC and Alberta, Alaska, and Montana. So those Shriners really wanted a, their own hospital, and that's what um, they started working on. But in 1924, they cared for 115 kids. And this was from the um, Chronicle back then, um, that we cured 115 kids. I don't know if they were actually cured, but they were actually what, um, I don't know if you can read this quote, but um, this came from this, that um, basically to get them back up and being a kid again. And that's what um, we had 115 kids that went through our hospital that first year. So this is just some other really, um, I, it was fun to go some, through some of these pictures. And um, of course, you know, when the hospital started, it was mainly because of polio, which is why we're mostly orthopedic. And um, what those throughout that region, they really wanted to make sure that they were getting all those kids and bringing them in, but no child ever had to pay. So they would bring the children and um, they, it was all, as this again, another quote, we don't accept pay for any medical services. It was something that they could take care of and that's what they did, which is still true today. If they have a pediatric orthopedic condition, that's the only requirement for care, which is amazing. So as I was saying, polio was a big deal. And when kids came in, um, they put them in isolation for actually three days to make sure that they weren't carrying anything or tuberculosis that they might transfer to the other kids. And um, the kids that were there could not bring any of their clothes or PJs or toys or anything. But when they got there, they were given all that. 
and that was a lot done by volunteers and a lot by um, our staff and, and people who wanted to um, provide that, but um, they were given everything they needed, and that was their own, gonna be their next little family for a while, and some of these kids, the average time that those kids stayed there was four months, and the only day that they could visit, a family would come from Montana maybe and drop their child off for months at a time. They could visit on Sunday, that was it, but not the siblings, and I actually found some pictures of the kids, you know, waving through the window. That's as far as the other, you know, their brothers and sisters could see them, but they couldn't come in. And then one other thing that I thought that was interesting was um, there weren't antibiotics at that time. So they would do kind of a, um, a scrub of them with um, a skin preparation and scrubbing that would um, have sterile um, towels. 48 hours before they had surgery, and then another time, 24 hours before they had surgery. That's how kind of they got them prepared for their surgery. And I just wanted to throw this up now. These kids, nowadays, we have an average of like four to five days. Even our big spines and things like that, we try to get our kids home by the end of the week. So um, no, they're, you know, those four months long um, stays are not um, part of our history anymore. Um, as far as the cost, again, like I said, no child ever paid. And back at the beginning, it was $3 a day that the patient was um, a cost to take care of ki a child. And even in 1956, which surprised me, it was still pretty low at 11. Now we, we're about $7,000 a day taking care of a kid. So, yeah, that was a little bit different. Um, and. So, like I said, so we were just a, a, a wing off of St. Luke's, and our Shriners really wanted to have their own hospital. So, what did they have to do? They have to raise the money, and they knew what they estimated the cost of that hospital is going to be between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars, which again just seems amazing to me. Um, but so they. Um, and this is just interesting, this um, J.D. Feltz, who was the county commissioner of, of building um, here in Spokane, was really an advocate for this. He wasn't a Shriner, but he really wanted to get this going. It was the time of the Depression, and he wanted to use unemployed craftsmen to be a part of the um, building and give them jobs. And so he really rallied the community to do just that. Um, a lot was donated at cost, out of their um, cement and their bricks and things like that. Um, so they were able to create, um, build the hospital at a lot, um, well, not less expensive, but with a lot more help. Um, this is something that grassroots kind of fundraising happened. And this guy, he was a Shriner. Uh, Mr. Flickinger, he w did a foil fundraising campaign where he asked everyone to, out of cigars and cigarettes, to save your foil. So they did this over the years, and they, on um, the last one, they, it was 100,000 pounds of foil that they sent to, they melted down, and they shipped it off to Chicago, and he was hoping maybe $100, $200, he got $1,500 from that effort. So that was huge out of $75,000 building that you're trying to do. And that kind of spurred other things. So there was people who did picnics that maybe would donate $100. Um, a lot of our Shriners and Masonic organizations, Eastern Star and that, um, would do activities. The, uh, 1936, the high school game between North Central and Gonzaga Prep, they donated $1,600 towards the effort. So it was all, there was, um, Chronicle had a baking contest that was raised $800. So it was just, there were so many activities because it was so important that, that we wanted to, and we were happy and lucky to have a hospital to take care of the kids in Spokane. People rallied around it. So in 1939, our new hospital, which is still up there on Summit, opened at $85,000, but by the time it was opened, it was completely paid for. So that was pretty amazing for back then. Um, and that one is still still up there. Um, when it was built, it's we still weren't doing our surgeries in the hospital. So there was a tunnel that went underground that went over from our little hospital over to St. Luke's to where they did the surgeries. And they used that to 1972 until they were able to build on to the, this hospital. But that's what they did. The kids got ready. They took them under a tunnel and through and over there, and then which would be kind of weird, but to me, <laughs> I'm a little guy or girl. Um, so, you know, these kids stayed in the hospitals for a long time. And I do hear, you know, a lot of people will come back and say, oh, I was in the hospital for this many years or that many years. And they really, they never have a negative feeling about it. Never, never, never. They would, I 
hear about these kids that would do wheelchair races down the hallways or you know they would become a family and the hospital was really important to them to make it enjoyable they had birthday parties if you had a birthday if you're there 100 days which happened a lot you would have a 100 day party which we still do not many of our kids are there 100 days it's mean they're international patients but we, they would have visitors that would come, Santa would come. Um, they would have celebrations to make sure that their life was as normal as a child's life should be, even though they were in the hospital. And again, getting back to absolutely no cost until we started taking insurance like six years ago. I mean, absolutely, our Shriners have taken care of these kids for so many years. And it came through the endowment, it came through donations from the community, but a lot from our Shriners and, and their efforts, which is still true today, as well as their dues and that. So that, that's what kept us going. And this picture is actually where um, our, the teachers would come in and work with the kids. But again, they were there quite some time and they would have regular class for these kids that would be there that long. So and another, just these are some really fun pictures of some, some visitors. They had sports people that would come. There was, um, this is Roy Rogers up in the corner. They had, you know, Santa, they would have Mickey Mouse and whoever that would come. And they, we still get a lot of visitors. That it's a little bit harder to see kids now with HIPAA and privacy and things like that. Back in the day, there was, not at our hospital, but um, Babe Ruth visited our kids, and there was, you know, it was, it was really great to have those visitors come in, and we get calls a lot from people that want to visit, but it's a little bit harder now. This is just um, another, some great pictures of our Shriners, and they continue to support this hospital and these kids. Um, these are, I just, I just love some of these um, from our supporting temples. We have 13, 12 supporting temples of our hospital, and these are just, they would do food drives, which again, can't do that because you can't bring just random food from outside into the hospital. So there's a lot more restrictions, but um, they would visit all the time and do activities and special events for the kids. In 1951, they did add on, and we got another 15 more beds, and um, that's when a lot of changes happened. And you can see, I won't read this whole thing, but um, many modern marvels happened. And they got x-ray, they got um, more equipment. And the one thing that kind of stood out to me is it was one of the few buildings that actually had heating and air conditioning, which you know, is amazing. So um, we really have always tried to do the best for our kids, even um, you know, all the way through the history of our hospital. And then after 52 years being up on Summit, uh, we have our hospital where we're still today. Uh, they started, they bought that property and then started building in 89. It opened in 91 and we are a 30 bed hospital. We are one of the smallest in the system, but I always say we're small but mighty. We are one of the most efficient. We have, we are actually busting out the seams right now. We are, we are very busy. We see about a thousand kids in our outpatient clinic. We do, you know, about 900 surgeries a year. Although the change and shift in medical delivery, most of our kids are outpatient. So about 75% of our surgeries are actually outpatient. So they don't, we don't have kids in beds as much anymore, but for the rest of the hospital, we are busy, 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 which is fantastic. We wanna make sure we're taking care of all those kids that need our help. And we're 100,000 square feet. We're pretty, if you've not been there and you want a tour, give me a call, I'd be happy to give you a tour. And that one was opened at a cost of 20 million. So we're actually thinking about what we need to do to keep growing and keep being able to take care of more and more kids. I wanted to share a little bit too about our name. So we were called Shriners Hospitals um, for Crippled Children up until 1996 which I thought it was earlier than that, that they switched to that. But in 1996, our Shriners at Imperial again um, voted at that time to drop the word cripple because they thought, felt that was um, not really reflective to the kind of kids that we treat. And today, I mean, we see kids who fracture their arm in a playground to the very extreme spines and hips and leg lengthening, things like that. But it, the crippled didn't really take in everything that our absolute expert surgeons can do. So they changed to the Shriners Hospital for Children and then just recently, um, in 2007, our current logo, which is more corporate -y looking, more general, and it's a lot more um, memorable. I think people recognize it a little bit more. And then we started doing more advertising. And when we started taking insurance, it got to the referrals. You could, a parent could call rather than some, it was a little bit more cumbersome to get a child into the hospital. So we're trying to be, more accessible for care for the kids. And then um, they, just a few years ago, we added the second um, logo, which has the heart, which is really who we are. You know, we're, that, that love to the rescue really embodies what our hospital has always been. And then just stepping back a little bit, um, we started out orthopedics 
And then in 1966, we opened our first burn care and we have four hospitals that take care of burns. Um, two of them only do burns and that's Cincinnati and Galveston and the other two are, have other conditions that we serve, um, take care of. But um, since the Shriners have gotten into burn care, the chance of survival um, has more than doubled because those are the absolute most expert doctors when it comes to pediatric burns. And then in the 80s, we added spinal cord. So kids with spinal cord injuries, um, getting back to um, whatever type of mobility that might be, we um, added one and that's Philadelphia and then Chicago and then another one in which was San Francisco, which is now Sacramento, but um, now we have three hospitals. Sacramento is actually the only hospital in our system that covers all four specialties and the fourth one is cleft lip and palate. So we added that as well. And in Spokane, we are only orthopedics, but um, cleft lip and palate is something we kind of would like to get back into. We were for a while, and then um, we'd like to start caring them for those kids again. But So this is where we are in the United States now. We're 19 orthopedics, and then three of us um, take care of spinal cords, four burns, and then nine cleft lip and palate. So um, like I said, you know, we're... The only thing that we care about is taking care of kids. And that's how it's been since the day they open the doors. It's, and it doesn't matter who they are, it doesn't matter if they can pay, it doesn't matter if it's a pediatric orthopedic condition that our doctors, we're the only doctors with pediatric fellowship trained um, experience in our region, except for you know, Seattle. But um, we're pretty, pretty excited to have that. So that's kind of a little history of, I think that's my last slide, um, yeah and we're looking forward to the next 90 years. So we'll be, actually this is our 93rd year this year. So we're, we're crawling up to 100, so it's pretty exciting. I didn't recognize, I've been saying 22 Shriner hospitals in the United States. That shows 22 in North America, which makes it even more special when you're saying all of North America, there's only 22 hospitals. One of them was in Mexico. So how about that? Okay. Well, our next half here is, this is ADA, Ada Anderson. She's um, all, part of the Eastern Star. Her father was a Shriner. She's been part of the Shriners for 20, 10 years. For 10 years, I did get that right, as my note said. And she's going to be speaking more on the organization that supports the Shriners Hospital, the Shriners themselves. So here is Ada Anderson. I'd like you all to go back in time with me to August 4th, 1889. That is when Spokane was known as Spokane Falls and Washington was the territory. You've heard of the expression, there's a hot time in the old town tonight. Well, there were no truer words spoken on that night because that's when the big fire that destroyed the downtown business district in Spokane was done. It was also a hot time back in Niagara Falls, New York, because the 17th session of Imperial Shrine was meeting to write a special dispensation for a new sh uh, shrine temple in Spokane Falls in Washington ter Territory. So they wrote their dispensation, and on July 10th, 1890, Spokane Falls had a new shrine temple. It was called El Katif Shrine, and the name was chosen by the first potentate, Clarence Scott. And El Katif is the seaport city in the Persian Gulf by the Red Sea. And any shrine temple that's created, the first potentate has the right to choose the name of the new shrine temple. So. El Katif Shrine has been in business for 127 years, right here in Spokane, Washington. On July 9th, 1891, they received their charter, and the first class had 43 novices, as they call them, that were the first men to become Shriners in Spokane Falls. Now, we have over 14,482 Shriners that have be, become members. Um, my favorite one is that Frederick Earl Michaels. He was a young man. He was born on April 12, 1861, when Fort Sumter was bombed and the Civil War started. 
I like this young man because I can take his history and put it with Shrine history and American history all in one. So as this Frederick Michaels grew, he decided he wanted to be a Shriner or a Mason. So he joined his Blue Lodge, which I couldn't find out in all the paperwork I'd been through, but that's okay. He was decided he wanted to be a pharmacist. So he went to pharmacy school and that was his chosen profession. So he decided after he joined his Blue Lodge that he wanted to become a Shriner. So on June 2nd, 1899, he was created a Shriner in El Khatif Shrine. What he didn't know, he was on the fast track to become El Khatif's 13th potentate in 1904. Now normally, it takes anywhere from eight to 10 years to become a potentate of El Khatif Shrine. So he was on the fast track. When he turned 50, he decided he was old. My sympathies to him. <laughs> because I'm well past that and I'm still working. Uh, he decided he'd take up bowling. And everybody knows that the top score in bowling is 300. Well, that was his number when he was created a Shriner. And he was created a Shriner at the height of the Spanish-American War. So you can see how history and him just, just come together. So, El Khatif Shrine has a rich history. We've had 125 potentates because the first potentate, Clarence Scott, served for two years, and the third potentate, Nathan Rundle, served for two years. Other than that, it's just been zip one every year. <laughs> so it's exciting to work at the Shrine office. It's exciting to see these petitions that I go through, that I've gotten all this history from. I love history, so it just kind of stays with me. It sinks in and just, it's there. Um, El Khatif is rich in family traditions because we have a lot of father-son combinations. We also have one family that has three generations that are currently active in El Khatif Shrine. Hopefully they're adding a fourth in two years. The great-grandson would be 18 then, so that's exciting to look forward to. Uh, we have one family that has given six potentates, I mean, six Shriners to Al Khatif Shrine, and that's the Sheehy family. Uh, the matriarch, Lona Sheehy, her husband was potentate in 1993. He has since passed on. Uh, her son, Jerry, was potentate in 2000. And his brother-in-law, Jay Smith, was potentate in 2011. Then they have three other grandsons that are members of El Khatif Shrine. So it's rich in history and rich in tradition. I can remember my dad back in the 50s getting all dressed up to go to a shrine meeting. He wore a tuxedo back then, and my mother was in a formal. And I thought, oh, this is not for me. <laughs> but I was caught up in it, and I still am active in Eastern Star and Masonic groups. But uh, I come from a rich history of the Masons, my grandparents, great-grandparents. So I'm thrilled to work at the Shrine office. It's so nice to come and talk to a group like this because I enjoy history and the El Khatif Shrine and the Shriners Hospital have worked hand in hand for over 90 years. And it's a wonderful organization. And I have another petition that was one of my favorites. It was a Mr. Lincoln had petitioned to join the Shrine. His petition was signed by Mr. Dodge and Mr. Harley. I just thought that was kind of unique. 
But um, Alcatraz Shrine is rich in the fathers of Spokane. Kristen talked about Levi Hutton. Well, Levi Hutton and May Arkwright Hutton, his wife, were both orphans, and they started Hutton Settlement. And it was a wonderful addition to Spokane. Another of our founding fathers, August Paulson, was a Shriner. Uh, Mr. Finch from Finch Arboretum. I can't remember his first name right now, but anyway, so the Shrine is rich in Spokane history. It's a great item, a uh, place to be. And I'm glad to be a part of this for so many years that uh, I just get excited when I get to come and talk about the Shrine and what it does for our Spokane community and what it does for a person individually. It builds you up, gives you character, and it makes you want to step forward and go out into your community and tell the world what a great fraternity the Elkatir Shrine is, or Shriners everywhere, and the philanthropy that they do. It's, it's just um, uh, wonderful. And I'm just so glad to be a part of it. And I want to thank you for having me today.